Greetings, everybody, and welcome to LitQuake's Epicenter. This is a spring and summer virtual series produced by LitQuake, San Francisco's literary festival. I am Jane Ganahl. I am the co-founder of LitQuake, and we are streaming live from the Bay Area and around the world, because that is, happens to be where Rivers is today. Our festival this year will take place October 7th through 23rd, both live and streaming at litquake.org. Yes, we are getting back to live events this fall. We are so excited. Hopefully, we'll be working with Charlie Jane at some point. Yay! I would, I would <laughs> love that. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, today we are honored to be able to present Rivers Solomon and Charlie Jane Anders in conversation. Uh, Rivers' new book, Sorrowland, is a genre-bending work of gothic fiction, a searing seminal book that marks the arrival of a bold new voice in fiction. She is in conversation. They are in conversation. Forgive me, I'm almost 70 years old and I'm still getting used to the they and the, yeah. Uh, in conversation with Rivers will be Nebula and Hugo award-winning author Charlie Anders, whose new novel, Victories Greater Than Death, is an epic YA sci-fi adventure. Um, but before we make our full introductions, I want to thank sincerely our friends at Green Apple Books, the official bookseller of tonight's event, and 48 Hills, which is the Bay Area's source of progressive news and culture. To quote their publisher, Mark Marky Bishki, the staff was so excited to be part of this event that we almost dropped the Kindle into our ramen. I, I just had to include that. Sign up for the daily 48 Hills newsletter at 48hills.org. It's actually a, a very serious website with absolutely amazing content. So I strongly encourage you. Quick orders of business. Please feel free to ask Rivers and Charlie, a Charlie Jane a question using the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom. Don't forget to follow LitQuake on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for latest updates. And last but not least, if you believe in keeping literature a key component of San Francisco's cultural landscape, please consider making a donation. We are a nonprofit and we do virtually 100% of our programming for free. We accept your charitable dollars on Venmo and PayPal or directly at litquake.org. And now let us get on with the show. Rivers Solomon, this is her, this is their bio. Rivers Solomon is a dyke, an anarchist, a she-beast, an exile, a shiv, a wreck, and a refugee of the transatlantic slave trade. Rivers, who uses them and they, and fey and fair pronouns, writes about life in the margin, where they are much at home. In addition to appearing on the Stonewall Honor List and winning a Firecracker Award, Solomon's debut novel, An Unkindness of Ghosts, which was put out by Akashic, was a finalist for a Lambda and a Locus Award. Solomon's second book, The Deep, was the winner of the 2020 Lambda Award and on the shortlist for a Nebula, Locus, and Hugo Award. And finally, Sorrowland, which has just come out, has already drawn raves in its first weeks of publication with Ms. Magazine, lauding its fantastic, terrifying sci-fi brilliance. Charlie Jane Anders is the author of the New York Times bestseller, All the Birds in the Sky, which was a Nebula Award winner. She, she is the organizer of the Writers with Drinks writing series and a founding member of io9, a website about science fiction, science and futurism. Her new YA novel, Victories Greater Than Death, also just got a beautiful review. Uh, tender, funny, vivacious. It focuses on saving the universe by making friends and fighting fascists. This book bubbles over with charisma, says the New York Times. Woo! Her stories have appeared in Asimov's Science Fiction, the magazine of fi fantasy and science fiction, on Tor.com, Ziziva, and several anthologies. And she has a new book coming out this summer that is an anthology of essays she has written for Tor. Um, and the name was not written down, so it's right out of my head, but maybe Charlie Jane can talk about it at some point during this conversation. Again, feel free to, oh my gosh, there's already 18 chat questions here. So I think we're going to have plenty today. Uh, please welcome Charlie Jane and Rivers. 
mute myself. Yay, thank you so much for having us. This is so an, such an awesome event. Thanks to everybody who came out on a Saturday afternoon on a beautiful day to like hang out with us. It's just such a thrill to be here. I'm so excited to chat with Rivers. You know, Sorrowland is one of my favorite books I've read in the past few years. It just totally rocked me. And it just like, I would, you know, I would go anywhere, any place to talk about Sorrowland. That book is just so amazing. And I'm just so, so happy to be here. Uh, please support Green Apple Books. Please support Litquake. Please support 48 Hills. They are all like amazing institutions and so wonderful. So uh, it said on the Eventbrite invite that Rivers and I would both be reading from our latest books. So we're going to do that. Uh, I'm going to go first. And you know, I thought since this is Lit Quake, uh, I would read like the most San Francisco part of the book, which is kind of about pranks. I'm just going to say, you know, when I first moved to the Bay Area back when like dinosaurs roamed the earth, I got involved with the Cacophony Society. I got to help be involved with the last few pranks that the Cacophony Society did before they went under. And I, I love pranks. I think pranks are like an underrated tool for fighting against fascism and oppression and evil. So I'm just going to read a little snippet of my teenage characters on Earth hatching a prank. This is before they go off into space to save the universe, but they kind of carry that whole spirit with them, I think. I'm just going to dive into it. Saturday morning, the sunlight invades my tiny curtained off bedroom and awakes me from a clammy bad dream. My phone is jittering with all the gossip from Waymaker fandom, along with random updates about some Clinton High School drama that I barely even noticed in the midst of my Morant obsession. And then there's a message from my best friend, Rachel, on the Lasagna Hats Discord server. The message says, Monday Barker, it's happening. Disco party, coming to pick you up at noon. Okay, so now you're wondering who the Lasagna Hats are. The Lasagna Hats Dis Discord server started out as a back channel group for Waymaker players until the game had one gross DLC update too many. We've all been there, right? And then we all started just chatting about whatever. And somehow this turned into a place to organize pranks and disruptions against world, all of the world's scuzziest creeps. So I grab my backpack, dump out all my school stuff and cram it full of noisemakers, glitter, and my mom's old costume stuff. I'm already snapping out of my anxiety spiral. The back seat of Rachel's car is covered with art supplies and sketch pads. And I can tell at a glance that her artwork has leveled up since the last time I saw her works in progress. As soon as I get into her car, Rachel starts chattering to me about Monday Barker. You know Monday Barker, right? He's that online personality who says that girls are naturally bad at science and math and that women should never have gotten the vote. Fucking hate that guy. Then Rachel trails off because she can tell that I'm only half listening. Okay, she says, what's wrong with you? I can barely find the words to tell Rachel that I've started having hallucinations about an alien serial killer. The artwork on Rachel's back seat includes a hand colored drawing of a zebra wearing a ruffly collar and a velvet jacket, raising a sword and riding a narwhal across the clouds. Somehow this image gives me the courage to explain to her about Morant, the alien serial killer. I'm pretty sure that those were memories from before, from my past life, I say. I think this means that the aliens are gonna come get me soon. That's great. Rachel glances at my face. Wait, why isn't it great? It is, except I've been waiting and dreaming for so long and suddenly it's now it's a real thing. And what if there's nothing out there but the evil alien murder team? And what if all the friendly aliens are gone or they don't bother to show up and get me? Huh, Rachel drives onto the highway and merges into traffic without slowing down. I guess there's only one way to find out. We make a pit stop at a convenience store and Rachel pauses in the parking lot. You remember when you punched Walter Goff for calling me an orca in a smock? It wasn't a smock. 
it was a nice chemise from Torrid and Walter Goff deserved worse. You remember the great lunch lady wore in that Frito pie costume you wore? I nod. The entire time I've known you, Tina have been telling you to stop being such an obnoxious pain in the butt, Rachel says with a gleam in her eye. But here you are, preparing to put on a ridiculous costume and prank Monday Barker. This is who you are. So if some alien murder team shows up to test you, I feel sorry for them. Rachel smiles at me. Everything suddenly feels extremely heavy and also lighter than air at the same time. Oh my God, I say, can I hug you? I know you don't always like to be touched, but Rachel nods and I pull her into a bear hug. She smells of fancy soap and acetone and her arms wrap around me super gently. Then she lets go of me and I let go too. And we go to buy some extra spicy chips and ultra caffeinated sodas, the perfect fuel for, for confronting ass millinery. I keep thinking of what Rachel said and a huge sugary rush just spread throughout my whole body. I feel like I almost forgot something massively important, but then my best friend was there to remind me. So Monday Barker is scheduled to speak at the Lions Club in Islington and we're setting up at the park across the street. Bet and Turtle have a glitter mist machine and a big disco ball and a dozen other people, mostly my age, have brought sparkly decorations. I wander around helping people to figure out the best place to set up since this disco party was sort of my idea. We've got this, says Turtle, buttoning their white suit jacket over a red shirt. Why don't you go get yourself ready? They've put pink streaks into their hair swoosh. I retreat to Rachel's car where I rummage in my knapsack and put on a bright red spangly tuxedo shirt and a big fluffy pink skirt I stole from my mom, plus shoes covered with sequins. Um, soon there are 20 of us across the street from the Lions Club, everyone feeding off everyone else's energy and hoisting Rachel's glorious sign that she painted. And a pro, a pro Monday Barker crowd is already gathering across the street on the front walk of this old one story brick meeting hall with flaking, with flaking paint on its wooden sign. A town car pulls up. Monday Barker gets out, flanked by two beefy men in dark suits holding walkie talkies. Monday Barker is about my mom's age with sideburns and sideburns, sideburns, sideburns enclosing his round face and a huge crowd of upswept hair. He waves in a robotic motion and his fans scream and freak out. Yeah, Monday Barker. Rrr! Someone on our side of the street fires up a big speaker on wheels playing old disco music. The handful of cops between us and the Lions Club tense up, but we're not trying to start anything. We're just having an impromptu dance party. The brick wall of the Savings and Trust Bank seems to shiver and I catch a glimpse of Morant, the giant with the scary perfect face and the sneering thin lips staring at me. But then I think about Rachel saying, if an alien murder team shows up to test you, I feel sorry for them. The throbbing grows stronger, but Morant is gone. The brick wall is just a brick wall again. The Monday Barker fans, mostly white boys with bad hair, are chanting something, but I can't hear them over our music. Rachel and I look at each other and whoop. Someone starts the whole crowd singing along with that song about how we are family. I know, I know it's ridiculous, but I get kind of choked up. We keep on chanting disco lyrics and holding hands until Monday Barker's supporters vanish inside the Lions Club to listen to their idol explain why girls shouldn't learn to read. Out here on the disco side, of the line, we all start high-fiving each other and jumping up and down. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much for reading. I loved hearing it in your voice. It was wonderful. Um, uh, hi again, everybody. I'm Rufus Solomon. Um, I thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Litquake. Thank you, Bookstore. This is just 
Um, it's wonderful to be here sharing space with you and having this chance to connect in this time where it's like especially difficult to connect with people, even if it's only virtually. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read a bit from my book, Sorrowland. Um, here it is. Um, I tend to default to reading from the very beginning um, so that I don't have to, you know, explain what's happening and so on. So I'm going to stick with that streak. Um, yeah, it's a bit different um, tonally. Um, so I just want to like do a sort of brief sort of warning of it's, um, you know, somewhat darker content. So if you want to sort of prepare yourself for that. Um, I don't know if I have any specific warnings to issue, but um, yeah, just a, a general, um, yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, Sorrowland, chapter one. The child gushed out from twixt Vern's legs, ragged and smelling of salt. Slight he was and feeble as a promise. He felt in her palms a great wilderness, such a tender thing as he could never be parsed fully by the likes of her. Had she more strength, she'd have limped to the river and drowned him. It'd be a gentler end than the one the fiend had in mind. Vern leant against the trunk of a log lolly and pressed the child naked and limp to her chest. His trembling lips lay right where the heart-shaped charm of a locket would be if she'd ever had a locket. So that's how it's gonna be, hmm? Win me over with lip wibbles, she asked. And though she was not one to capitulate to bids for love, this baby had a way about him that most did not. There was courage in his relentless neediness. He would not be reasoned out of his demands. Vern reached for the towel next to her. With what gentleness she could muster, and it wasn't enough to fill a thimble, she dragged Rough Terry over the baby's mucky skin. Well, well, she said, cautiously impressed. Look at you. Vern's nystagmus and resultant low vision were especially troublesome in the waning light, but pulling her baby close lessened the impact of her partial blindness. She could see him full on. He was smaller than most newborns she'd had the occasion to handle and had inherited neither her albinism nor her husband Sherman's yellow boneness. His skin was dark, 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 and Byrne found it hard to believe that the African ancestry that begat such a hue had ever once been disrupted by whiteness. The only person Byrne knew that dark was Lucy. Viscous cries gurgled up from the child's throat, but died quickly on the bed of Vern's skin. Her flesh was his hovel, and he was coming to a quick peace with it. His bones were annals of lifetimes of knowledge. He understood that heat and the smell of milk were to be clung to or else. It was a shame such instincts would not be enough to save him. As much as Vern had made a haven here these last few months, the woods were not safe. A stranger had declared war against her and hers. His threats increasingly pointed of late. A gutted deer with its dead fawn fetus curled beside. A skinned raccoon staked to a trunk, body clothed in an infant's sleep suit. And everywhere, everywhere, cottontails hung from trees, necks and nooses, and feet clad in baby booties. The fiend's kills, always maternal in message, revealed a commitment to theme rarely seen outside a five-year-old's birthday party. Another girl might have heeded the warnings to leave the woods, but Vern preferred this obvious malevolence to the covert violence of life beyond the trees. To be warned of bad happenings afoot was a welcome luxury. People might have followed Vern off the compound when she'd fled if there'd been a fiend there discarding dead animals as ovaries. Hush now, Vern said, then thinking it was what a good man would do, sang her babe a song her ma'am used to sing her. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you mourn. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you mourn. Pharaoh's army got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't weep. Even though it was a spiritual, 
it wasn't a song about Jesus direct, which suited Vern because she hated music about the Christ. It was one of the few items on which she and her husband Sherman agreed. She nodded along to every sermon he gave about the ways the white man plundered the world under the direction of this so-called savior. Whole continents reek of the suffering that man has caused. Can you smell it? He would ask. The congregation would shout, shout, amen, Reverend Sherman, we smell it. And then he'd ask, don't it stink? And they'd say, yes, Reverend, it sure does. And he'd ask, but does it stink here on the blessed acres of Cain where we live lives removed from the white devil God of Abel and his followers? The people would cry out, no. According to Ma'am, there was a time when Cainites were less ardent about Reverend Sherman's teachings. His predecessor and father, Eamon Fields, was the congregation's true beacon, an early settler of the compound, arriving in the first wave. Eamon rose quickly from secretary to accountant to deacon to reverend. He was a stern man, violent. But for Cainites who'd been traumatized by the disorder inherent to Black American life, Puritanical strictness held a dazzling, charismatic appeal. Sherman was not so hard as his father before him, which disoriented the brothers and sisters of the compound. In the end, he won them over on the pulpit, entrancing all with his passionate sermons. And do we dare abandon the compound and mingle our fate with those devilish outsiders? Sherman asked. No, Reverend. That's right, my beautiful brothers and sisters, kings and queens, sons and daughters of Cain. We stay here where there is bounty, free from the white devil dogs who would tear us limb from limb. Their world is one of filth and contradiction, poison and lies. Rich folks in homes that could house 50, 100, 200, while the poorest and sickest among them rot on the street. Would we allow that here? No. Sherman could make lies out of the truth. Vern had learned that much as his wife, but she full believed her husband's fiery sermons about the Nazarene. She'd witnessed the curious hold Jesus had on people from her trips off the compound. Every other billboard and bumper sticker preached his gospel. Christ talk made up the few words Vern could read by sight because they were everywhere in large print. Jesus, hell, salvation, John 3.16. He was on t-shirts, bracelets, anklets, mugs, and that damn cross everywhere. The whole world outside the blessed acres of Cain seemed an endless elegy to Christ and his dying, his bleeding, his suffering. How come white folks were always telling black people to get over slavery because it was 150 or so years ago? but they couldn't get over their Christ who died 1830 years before that. Who cared if he rose up from the dead? Weeds did that too. It wasn't in Vern's nature to trust a man with that much power for how did he come to have it? And I'm gonna finish there. Hey, Amber Marie, show some love. Oh my God, that was amazing. I love this book so much. Um, I'm yeah, so happy to so be here with you. Next, it's so good to be here with you too. Oh my God, this is like, this is the height of, this is like the, the yeah, this is like the, the highlight of my, of my week. And I'm just so happy that we're getting to talk about, you know, trans science fiction and queer science fiction and like, you know, um, so, you know, one of the things that really struck me about uh, Sorrow Land is how it's about kind of running away from one kind of, you know, family or community structure and finding another one. And, you know, obviously we don't want to get too deep into spoiler territory, but, you know, it, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, like whether that was something you thought about as you were writing it, because it feels like by the end, Vern has a new family around her with like Gogo -Go and everybody else and her, yeah. and obviously her kids and yeah. Absolutely. So at the beginning of the book, I don't think that I necessarily intended for this arc to be there, but it definitely emerged. Um, when Vern uh, leaves the compound of the cult where she was brought up, um, 
she kind of basically wants nothing to do with people at all. Um, to her, family is violence, it's lies, um, it's, you know, all of these terrible things that she's witnessed growing up and she wants nothing a part of that. And so, you know, she does the thing of, you know, fucking off into the woods, basically. Um, and she has her children there with her. But um, over the course of the story and over the course of her journey and the changes she's making, it's like, okay, that's, you know, um, that sort of the loneliness of that um, is no better, you know? It's like, okay, frustratingly, unfortunately for her and her mind, it's like, okay, maybe she maybe needs people um, and to trust people. And um, how does she like learn how to do that as someone who has a lot of very like well-earned trust issues. Um, and, and, you know, eventually she does find people, she does find points of connections, she finds her people. And like, it is to me at its heart, this, despite everything else that's going on in the story, and there's a lot, there is this aspect of like found family of, you know, finding the people who really see you and accept you and, love you for who you are and um yeah and I, I don't know I mean I feel like you have that in victory is greater than death too like it's definitely a, a found family story too don't you think like am yeah I <laughs> thank you and yeah I mean that was something that I was gonna you know I that was gonna say I feel like that is something that even though our books are so different that is something that they have in common and like you know Tina the main character of victory is really you know she believes that when the aliens come to get her, she's going to find her family with them and that, you know, she's going to know who she's supposed to be, but also she's going to find where she belongs and who she belongs with. And the aliens do come to get her, but, you know, spoiler alert, in the end, it's not so much this, this alien kind of space Navy thing that she joins yeah. that is really kind of her real family. It's, it's more that she, like, she finds this group of other teenagers, mostly from all over Earth, who become her family. And she kind of keeps pushing against that because that's not what she thinks she wants, but then it is kind of in the end what she really wants. And I think, you know, yeah, this thing of like where you feel like you should, where, you, where you, you've been told you should belong or where you think you should belong, or, you know, like also the thing of like wanting to go it alone and wanting to just be like, like that's another thing is like, that I feel like is in both of our books, like, you know, yeah, so. Yeah, we have these um, like lone savior types, you know, who are. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't It's quite... really true. Yeah. You know, I feel like that, yeah, and it, it is this thing of like, you, you're, you're like the, the one powerful person. You're the one person who can like, you know, save yourself, save, you know, others around you but you don't need saving and like then you realize that actually it's better if we save each other maybe I don't know yeah and like you know I, I, I love the relationship between Vern and Gogo so much because it just feels so you know it kind of grows so naturally and it's so warm and beautiful and I love the the way that we kind of find out again spoiler alert that Gogo is trans and you know the way Gogo talks about her own culture and her own experiences. I, I just love everything about that relationship. Was was that relationship something that you kind of planned on as you were writing or was it something that kind of just, I don't know, was it something that just kind of happened? I think something I've learned is that there always tends to be, whether I intend for it or not, a romantic subplot of some sort that emerges in most of the things that I write. Um, and it could just be like kind of one of those slightly oh too gay to function sort of things it's like gotta put the gay ladies in there <laughs> kind of thing um but yeah I don't know I think I think there's something about Van and Gogo that just fits together so beautifully um and they both have like hurts and you know things that they're sort of working with and stuff and I love the idea that they can sort of come together despite those things and like I was recently talking to a friend um about you know the idea of found family and stuff and in the way that it appears in like a lot of queer fiction and how it can be kind of a little bit romantic or this romanticized vision of what it's like it's oh yeah you leave your shitty home and then 
you know, you find these magic people and then, you know, you never have problems again. Like, that's, and um, so it was kind of really fun to, you know, explore them having tensions and stuff as well and coming together despite those things. And um, yeah, being together and finding that harmony and that love. And yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> so not yeah I mean you know I mean you know belonging to like a community or belonging to like someone you know it comes with obligations as well as you know and you have to consider their needs as well as your own and like it's it's a it's a burden as well as a as well as lifting you up it, you have to you have because you have to lift up other people too and I feel like that's something that Vern really struggles with like um, which I, is part of what I love about Vert as a character is that she's just like so incredibly like she's so determined to do things her way and she is so like you know like she'll she'll just kind of isolate herself in these really dramatic ways even you know and obviously part of it is her body is changing which again spoiler alert but I thought that was such a great like I love like those kinds of metaphors for, you know, growing up and coming of age, like your body is changing and you don't know what to do about it. Yeah. You know, like, I feel like we all dealt with that kind of, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, Absolutely. especially trans people and queer people, like, you know, it's like, and non-binary people, you know? Yeah. And like, like, that's part of the coming of age story that like, yeah. And sorry. No, no, no. The thing with Vern, I think the, this aspect of her where she's like do everything herself the way that she wants to do it and like I think part of the reason she's like that is it's she had to be like that in the place where she grew up and stuff um and I do think like one of the things spoiler alert the sort of metamorphosis um represents or is like a metaphor for is that like just that general sort of thing that we all do of sort of going through a crisis and a period of growth um, and, you know, sort of reckoning with all of the trauma that she's had about from her past and stuff um, and to getting to a place where she can like open up to other people. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and I feel like there's a kind, I mean, okay, I know we said at the beginning that our books are like, don't have that much in common, but now I'm thinking like, I feel like there's it's like I'm like actually you know there's also like kind of you know transformation you know in in victories greater than death too so it's like <laughs> yeah I mean that was something I was just thinking about because we were talking about like your body changing and you don't know what what to do with that and like you know it's something that definitely happens in both our books and I feel like you know it's something that a lot of coming of age stories kind of skate over or kind of skip past is like this thing of like, you know, obviously not every coming of age story has somebody growing like a, a exo, a fungus <laughs> exoskeleton or, a, you know, or, a, you know, or turning bright purple and getting giant or whatever, but, but your body is changing. Like that's the age where your body is changing. And like, you are dealing with stuff and like, you know, Vern not only having this like, kind of fantastical transformation, but also being a, a mother and like all the, like, and being, and still being a teenager, like yeah. there's just so much going on there. You know, I wanted to ask you about religion because like that passage you read, it really reminded me of how religion is, how important religion is in your book. You know, was that an important part of what you wanted to talk about? And like specifically religion and trauma, like how the way that people kind of that religion traumatizes us, but also encourages us to kind of turn our trauma into part of the bonding, like we're supposed to bring our trauma to God or whatever, and then it's going to bring us closer together. But it, but religion is also inflicting trauma on us at the same time. Like, was that something that you were kind of thinking about as you were writing or yeah. you wanted to deal with? Yeah, I have always tangled with religion, sort of my specific religious background, my whole life. And I'm not like, I'm not anti-religious, though I can be sort of anti sort of abusive religious institutions because I do think people obviously find um, wonderful sort of meaning and all of these things in it. But my own background, I remember from 
being as young as like five or six years old, like thinking, um, oh no, God hates me. I know that I am wrong and bad and, you know, something that's not what you're supposed to be like. Um, and then later I went to an extremely conservative um, Southern Baptist school um, in Texas, um, very fundamental mentalist and it was absolutely sort of one of the most traumatic experiences of my life um and like I don't know I think it's something that we have to reckon with because it's something that so many people go through um and specifically sort of queer people trans people if you're you know if you're if you've sort of been marked as someone who's outside of, you know, this narrative of what a good person is or who can be saved and, and you know, it, it, I don't know, it's something that we all have to deal with because people in power sort of use religion, um, you know, to enact these, these terrible things. Um, and I do think that something that was really important to me is that Eventually, Vern in the book does find aspects of religious expression or spiritual expression um, that aren't sort of tied with this, this trauma. And one of that, one of the ways that happens is through the sort of spiritual practices um, of Gogo and Bridget. So these are sort of people that are in her found family um, and um, who are Ogala Lakota and um, yeah, so I, it was also important to me to show a side of, you know, spirituality and um, connection to sort of the otherworldly, um, or the not just material world that could be um, something beautiful and healing as well. Um, so yeah, definitely. <laughs> Religion's big. Yeah. Religion, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it is big. And like, God, I was, when I was a kid, I sang in church choirs for like years and years and years. And, you know, it was like Episcopalian. It was like the big ruffly collar and the big purple frock that went down to my ankles. And like, you know, we had to like stand a certain way and kind of look like we were thinking holy thoughts, even though we were mostly thinking about like, you know, doing you know, terrible things. I don't know. We were like all <laughs> like pranks on each other and like beating each other up and like, you know, as you know, we were kids. Um, but it was like this weird thing where like it was like this kind of performance you had to put on, which was really interesting. I don't know. So like, it's, I'm thinking about the fact that like both Vern and and Yetu, your character from like the deep, both kind of run away from their community. They're both running away from a community that has this like kind of deep history of struggle that like in the case of the deep it's like people are kind of not wanting to know that history they're kind of wanting to repress it and just give it to this one person and in the case of you know cane land the gross acres of cane the history of struggle is kind of they're only getting part of the story and they're getting kind of this self-serving version of the story is that is that a theme that you feel drawn to of like running away from communities that try to kind of impose their idea of struggle on you i guess did that make sense i don't know yeah, no, it does. I think what interests me is the sort of myriad ways that we like deal with history and the past and memory in general and how how we talk about it um, can sort of shape our beliefs and our culture um, and things like that. And um, there is like a huge, I think, in everything that I've written, but especially in the deep and in this book Sorrowland, a kind of anti-authoritarianism. Um, both of the characters, both Yetu and Vern, like really, really don't fit in, in the places that they're sort of meant to fit. And um, when you have, I think, a character like that, a sort of outsider for someone who can't, who just can't get with the program, as it were, like it really puts into to focus um, the ways that sort of authority and power and trying to sort of control the narrative and control people in general, like how, um, how problematic it is. Um, so I think that that's something I kind of wanted to explore with that. Um, also, 
I mean, there are a lot of overlaps between the deep and, and Sarah land that maybe I, maybe I won't say more because maybe it's too into spoiler territory, but yeah. <laughs> I, I never care about spoilers. I'm more terrible. <laughs> I'm just like, whatever, you know, but yeah. you know, yeah. And like, God, the, the thing of like somebody else's struggle, the thing of like people having like a struggle that, that like was there before you came along and I think that's another overlap between our books, actually, is the thing of like, there's a struggle that's been going on since before you were born and you're kind yeah. of enlisted into one side of it. And like, maybe it's not as simple as you were told. Maybe the people, you know, maybe it's actually more complicated. I don't know. I think it's really interesting. You know, something that I really loved about Sorrowland, and by the way, just let me say, I know that uh, Jane was saying this in the chat, but please, please, please put questions in the Q&A function. It's already 1240. We're probably going to open it up for audience questions in like, ooh, I don't know, maybe five minutes. I don't know. Um, something that I really loved about Sorrowland is this kind of thing of like, which I you talked about in this interview I read with Shondaland about like, um, you know, the thing of like creating hierarchies with humans at the top and nature at the bottom, which is something that I'm obsessed with in my own work. Like it's something that I write about over and over and over again. Like this, the idea that we're separate from nature, but that also we're above nature, which I think is actually comes back to religion really, right? Yeah. Like, you know, what made you want to write about that? What made you want to write specifically about that in a context where like Vern is kind of transforming into, you know, something that's not entirely human anymore? Yeah, I mean, I grew up completely outside of nature. Um, for us, like from, from my friends and I, from my family, like exploring, you know, the wilds was like, oh, we're gonna go to like the part of the housing development where like the houses aren't fully built, you know, and that's like, that was our, <laughs> that was our nature oh, um, and a golf course and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I think as I've grown older, I've seen how that alienation from nature has been like, I don't know, extraordinarily like, like traumatizing. Like, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be, like to just be so disconnected from our place in this web, this grand complex like thing. And it's like, I think it's lonely to, to be outside of it and to not sort of see ourselves within this extremely grand context and our connection with um, non-human animals and with plants and you know with fungi and with the dirt and all of these things that we're a part of um, and it, it, I guess I think I had this fantasy something I want to talk about is like as a kid though I did read so many like nature books like I was a very very fond of the kind of the very typical child novel of you know the the boy and his knife in the woods like things like hatchet and my side of the mountain and all of those kinds of stories oh, where wow. you know you see you know those sort of survivalist <laughs> <laughs> those survivalist stories and I kind of want to twist that because I think so many those stories often have such a, a sort of colonialist um air to them a kind of conquering of nature um you know you against the world and I don't know I think I'm interested in like me with the world like how um you know that the 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 earth is like protecting and like sheltering me and like providing for me and I too can provide for it you know um so yeah yeah and like I mean this thing where humans are like have to be superior to all other creatures on on our planet I mean, do you think that's, this is kind of a weird question, but do you think that's part of where like our love of hierarchies in general comes from? Like once we have a hierarchy with humans above everybody else, we have to start making hierarchies among humans or, because I feel that's like, really, I, don't I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's a big question. So I don't, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say anything that I would fully stand by here without thinking about it more. But I do think there has been a lot of work that sort of connects specifically like colonialism, for example, um, as very much a project of creating a class of human as the sort of European sort of colonizer and then the things that are not human. And I think very often colonized peoples got sort of in that category of not, of, of, of not humans as animals. And so I do think that that absolutely does kind of have to be a link there and I think I mean, I don't know what it is, um, 
but I don't know. I don't think you're, I don't think you're on the, the wrong track there necessarily. I think that's, what do you think? I mean, I think, yeah, actually Milo, who's a friend of mine was saying in the chat that like, it seems like a chicken or the egg question. It's like, we, you know, probably a little of both, but yeah, I think that it's no accident that when you want to, to kind of other people or subjugate them, you want to dehumanize them. You want to like make them lot, not people anymore. Yes. And I think that that's a thing that like, you know, and that's part of how the mechanism that we use to like, yeah. Um, so like, before, we're going to open up to audience questions in a sec, but I just wanted to like, one more thing, like another thing that, you know, is interesting in, in both our books, but especially, you know, in your book, I think is the theme of language and the theme of like naming. And like you had, there's this great quote that's like, if you name something, you can hate it. And, you know, that's the thing in religion, like Adam, you know, names the creatures and that's how Adam becomes like, it comes back to that thing of like humans being above everybody else because we name them, they don't name us. Like, what made you like, what made you want to explore that theme of like naming and language and like the power of, of, of like putting a name on something? Yeah, I think for me, especially as it comes out in Sorrowland, um, that I was thinking about it specifically in terms of like queerness actually, and sort of the different ways we sort of talk about our experiences and the way that we police different words and stuff and you know from like you know queer itself to trans and lesbian and all of these different things and what that means and I don't even necessarily have any answers but I really just kind of wanted to reckon with the idea that I do think naming maybe this is a bit too like platonic and plato like there's the idea of there's like this ideal thing and then there's like the language that we give it is kind oh of like inherently like a kind of reduction or something you know um and i do think that sometimes words kind of can reduce the expansiveness um and words and language have been used to to, to oppress and to subjugate and um I don't think anything that's the book at its heart is like in so many ways about sort of, you know, the United States's traumatic history, um, you know, what it's enacted as a power. And I think you can't really talk about like that colonialism and you can't talk about all of that without talking about the way the role that language has in that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely, definitely true. And like, yeah, I mean, okay, we should open up to audience questions. <laughs> So Adanze, another friend of mine, wants to ask you a question, Rivers. Will you ever write a sequel to The Unkindness of Ghosts? Because Adanze feels like it kind of had a cliffhanger ending. And this is so funny to me. This is this is where it's really funny being a writer because like to me, it doesn't have a cliffhanger ending at all. It's like all completely clear to me. <laughs> so it's oh like, my God. But indeed, it's so wrapped up so perfectly. It was too neat. Um, so that's, it's really funny. Um, I probably will not write um a sequel to an unkindness of ghosts but i will say i think for some i will like just do my sort of authorial like tell you what happened if if that's helpful to hear which is that um i think some people read the ending ambiguously you know asta for those who haven't read it spoiler alert i don't know if you want to pluck your ears or whatever asta has returned to earth um and she's alone there but to me it's like clear that okay they now know the way to earth back up on the ship the oppressed people have risen up and taken over and they will all shortly be taking shuttles down to earth and you know happily ever after like that's how it is in my mind um so if that i don't know if that's helpful for you to hear um but yeah i probably won't write a sequel just because you know i do agree that there's like things oh, there's always more story that you can tell but like time is short yeah <laughs> there's only so many hours in the day and so many books you can write yeah, yeah. i mean i i may or may not have had that thing before of like people thinking something ended on a cliffhanger i'd be thinking no i like tied everything up with a bow <laughs> you know i may have gotten that a few times a few hundred <laughs> times <laughs> like i don't know uh, so another friend of mine amber wants to know uh if like amber was pleasantly surprised that we both sang, which I also thought was 
awesome. You know, I like it when people like sing a little bit in the middle of readings. Um, so if our stories were adapted to film for both of us, what songs or music genres would you want on the soundtrack to bring home the themes? I want you to so, answer this. Okay, I actually have a really good answer. Well, I don't know if it's a good answer, but I have, a, I have an answer, which is that I made a Spotify playlist for Victories Greater Than Death, which I can, uh, I can I'll, I'll tweet out the link later. I've tweeted it out before. And um, A, very important. A lot of people don't know this, but Janelle Monet recorded a cover version of Heroes by David Bowie a few years ago. So that's the theme song of like my book right there. Uh, but also like the playlist is kind of a mix of, because the characters in my book come from like all over the world. And, you know, there's a kid from China who's a mu musician, Wang Yiwei. There's like a kid from, a, a Travis G from Brazil. There's like someone from India. You know, I tried to kind of represent that in the playlist. And I think any soundtrack that I wanted, would want to have would represent that as well. I've been listening to a lot of Brazilian funk lately, uh, especially by queer artists. I was literally just listening to Lineker e Os Caramelos who are incredible. They are amazing. It's like, I don't know exactly how Lineker identifies but some kind of gender queer, gender fluid, non-binary identity, I, I'm guessing, and just, Go watch their videos. Lindiker, A.S. Caramellos, they're amazing. Okay, your turn. Um, I think for me, there'd be a lot of um, blues and jazz, um, a lot of the kind of very like lovely queer women blues greats, um, and like some early sort of black rock and roll, I think. Um, there's a lot of Sorrowland that even though it takes place you know roughly now that kind of feels I think kind of a little bit outside of time at places and stuff and it draws so much on historical things that I think like that sort of historical music would um, be a really good place so yeah that's my answer to that um, yeah. Now I need you to make a playlist. I know. No, no. I, I, a see, I made a play. I made a playlist for um, an unkindness of ghosts, and I didn't make one for the deep because it's like, well, the deep by well, clipping kind of. <laughs> I mean, it's already got a theme. It's already got yeah. soundtrack. You know. Yeah. So I, I absolutely need to do one for Sorrowland. You're right. Like I've been remiss, so I will do that. <laughs> Man, I, I would. Please send me the link if you put up a playlist because I want to listen to that, especially with if it's the music you just described. Like, oh my God, I love it. Um, yeah, so Stephen asks if we can both speak about our relations to genre, whether science fiction or gothic. Uh, it struck Stephen that in both of our books, we set up genre expectations for something to happen and then we totally twist it and surprise the reader, which makes me really happy because, you know, that's something that I always want to do. I don't know. Talking about genre is so tricky because um, one, I think it means different things to different people. Like, you know, I'm like, and I do think so much of the word genre is just about like kind of like managing people's expectations of what they'll find in a book. So for me, um, to, but also when something you want to do as a writer is like to surprise and to, you know, resist, you know, tropes and stuff. So it's, it's kind of really funny thinking about it. Um, in general, I just want to write things that are super like entertaining and engaging and dark. And like, sometimes that means there's, there are going to be monsters. Sometimes that means there's going to be spaceships. You know, it just, you just don't know. Um, and I just kind of let the story, you know, go where it needs to go. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I like twists. I don't know. I'm just kind of rambling now. I don't know. I have <laughs> Charlie, you, you, you go Charlie Jane. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's so funny. Like, I feel like you're, you're totally right that like, when you talk about genre, different people hear different things and like genre is like for a reader, genre is like the way to find the book that was like the book you like last. Like you're like, well, I really liked like, you know, there's a whole generation of readers who really like Twilight. And so they're like, where can I find more books like Twilight? And then there was a whole industry that was like, here's more books like Twilight. Yeah. I have a friend who basically her writing career was just like 
single-handedly recharged by the book Fifty Shades of Grey because she had been writing like BDSM erotica for a long time. And, you know, there wasn't a huge market for BDSM erotica for a while there. And then Fifty Shades of Grey came out and everybody was like, we need a hundred more books like this right now. And she was like, oh, well, I got you covered. And like, it totally like, you know, she wrote a book that sold like way more than her previous books just because, it, you know, so that's what genre it partly is. And that's why even if you don't like Fifty Shades of Grey, it did a lot of good for a lot of people and ditto Twilight and ditto like a lot of other. I, but, you know, I feel like when you're a writer and also when you're kind of steeped in this stuff, genre is kind of like a roadmap in a way. If and you have to kind of like, like I obsess a lot about like making genre work for me rather than the other way around. And the thing I talk about a lot is that before All the Birds in the Sky, I was working on a urban fantasy novel that was kind of like in the Jim Butcher, Richard Cadry kind of like, you know, tough, tough guy, you know, fighting supernatural stuff in a city in New York, actually. And I, there's stuff I really love about that book, but I ended up kind of not, I ended up putting it away. And then I came back to it recently because I was like, well, maybe I can polish this up and turn it into a novella because I've been doing that with some of my other unpublished novels recently. And um, I looked back at it and I was like, wow, this book was like putting the cart before the horse in terms of like genre stuff. Like there's a lot of stuff where like the main female character in the book is kind of a femme fatale, kind of a damsel in distress. And she doesn't really get to have a lot of agency in the story because I'm following the genre tropes rather than like being like, Make, making the genre tropes would follow me and do what I want them to do. And so, you know, I actually was like, okay, revising this is going to be a lot harder than I expected. And I'm going to, I put it aside for now, but I'm going to, I will come back to it because I think there's some ideas in there that I really want to explore. But I feel like this is, it's so easy to do that, especially like if you spend so much time, as much time as I have, like obsessed with the genre and like kind of consuming it, just like shoving it in my face. I feel like you could easily internalize object, uh, like expectations of like, well, here's where the big fight scene is and here's where the, yeah. and like, you know, it made me happy and victory is greater than death when people really thought that like something, minor spoiler, something was the final battle and it wasn't the final battle. It was actually kind of a mistake kind of that we realized was a mistake afterwards. And like, but I feel like I successfully, like people were tweeting me like, oh, it's the final battle. I'm so excited. Like they tweeted me like an hour later, wait, what happened? <laughs> like, and I'm like, eh, okay, good. I got you, you know? So, um, so more questions than anybody? I see there's a question for me and I kind of hate to, but I guess I will answer it because, you know, it's, uh, so Milo uh, asks if I could talk about the role of the Royal Fleet in our story and how I, complicated and transformed the concepts of the military that we are used to here on earth, which is like a really awesome question. And I'm really, I really love that question. You know, in a nutshell, there are two things about that. One is I didn't want to be writing military science fiction, which is a whole, like speaking of genre, bringing it back to genres and how genres come with like expectations. That's a, a big one. And military science fiction is a huge genre right now, which I really wanted to kind of, I didn't want to like do something that people who love that genre would be a, upset by, but I didn't want to like play into it. I didn't want to like write about gruff people in uniforms, barking orders and like, you know, I didn't want to just do all the tropes of that genre. And I did, you know, and it's a young adult book, which young adult is not a genre, but it does have expectations of its own that come with it. And so I didn't want my teenage characters to be just running around obeying orders for the entire book because nobody wants to read that in a YA book. Nobody, not even me. <laughs> and like, so, I was like really, and also I wanted to kind of set up something for the later books in the trilogy that like this, the Royal Fleet is not as great as people had made it out to be. It's got a lot of problems. It's an, it's like the US military in that, or it's like the United States in that it has these high ideals that it completely does not live up to in any way, like completely fails to live up to those ideals that it professes. Um, so I like, um, I wanted to create a military that was not as hierarchical as an earth military where there aren't ranks as such, but I also wanted to give scope for my teenage characters to kind of act alone. And so that was kind of the balancing act that I did. And I could talk about that for hours, but I don't want to hog the spotlight. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Anybody, I can, otherwise I can just ask, you know, we can just talk for a few minutes about queer science fiction and why, what it means to queer science fiction, because that's something that I'm always obsessed with. Okay, we're just going to talk about that. 
<laughs> what do you think it means to queer science fiction? And like, why do you think it's necessary to queer science fiction? I think because, I mean, on, its, on the most simple level, queering science fiction is putting ourselves, our stories, our rebellions, our bodies, our specific, you know, things um, into science fiction, because I don't think there's any sort of, I mean, we talk about science fiction and fantasy too, as this kind of inherently like revolutionary genre that's like about exploring possibilities and about sort of commenting and um, extrapolating about our, our own world and like political struggles. And it's like, well, how are you going to do that without sort of writing about queer liberation? Like it doesn't, that's, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so yeah, and I think something that I love about like being queer, being trans or not cis is like so much of my life. And I think this, this for other people too is about sort of being conscious about who we are and who we want ourselves to be and making ourselves and shaping ourselves. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I think that's just such a sort of sci-fi theme. Like we've already talked a little bit about like metamorphosis and stuff like that, but you know, just, I don't know, just this idea of the possibility of it all, like imagining the possibilities um, for ourselves. Like, it's like, all, it's like all sci-fi needs to be queer. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, I think you're right. <laughs> I think that, you know, like, so I, I think that queerness is kind of in the DNA of science fiction in this weird way, even though it was so trying to be like this hetero, white dude thing for so long with what are our cis het white dude thing for so long like it's just you know it's interesting that you know i feel like science fiction like like you were kind of saying in a way it's like the united states so that it hasn't always lived up to its ideals it hasn't always done the things that it said it was going to do it's it's often kind of fallen short of its if, of its aspirations and um you know um but also i think that there is this theme in science fiction of like transformation and kind of finding your real who your real identity and 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 you know transcending our limitations as people that I think is just maps onto queerness super well and it's not an accident that so many of the like classics of like old school science fiction like the forever war and like left out of darkness are so queer um so we're almost done but I, I there's one more question for for rivers which it's from an anonymous attendee and it's, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but it's about, you know, whether, you know, basically talking about like Verne's albinism and how it's, you know, a mechanism to talk about ability and disability, but also, you know, a way of talking about race and skin color. And like, you know, can you just talk about that for a moment? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and in many ways, the decision to make Verne albino is, arbitrary and that you know that's just a way that a person can exist in a body that we can have and I want to talk about all the sort of different ways that we can like exist in bodies and stuff and specifically ones that we don't talk about very often um so there's that um I do think and I don't know how much of this came and ended up existing in the final version of the book but there is a way in which um I do think that um albino people can be sort of like exoticized um, or um, fetishized and specifically I think in sort of um, different sort of folk like magic practices um, and there's an, a way that that sort of happens a bit um, in Cane Land um, and I don't I actually I can't even tell you how much I don't fully remember how much of that has actually ended up in the final version of the book but um, yeah, it's basically that, but at its heart, it's really just, you know, she's albino because she's albino, and that's just a part of her body and who she is, so, yeah. Cool. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm jumping back in here to say uh, thank you so, 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 so much to River and Charlie Jane for the amazing discussion. I have a feeling it's the kind of thing where if you know, 50 people watched it live. The Once we get the 
the Earl out there once we posted on our, our Facebook channel, uh, sorry, on our YouTube channel that um, more people will tune in. Uh, still a great audience for noon on a Saturday. So um, uh, you, we, we owe that entirely to you two and your incredible work. I wanna thank Green Apple for being the bookseller um, and uh, 48 Hills for promoting the hell out of this event. And of course, Rivers Solomon and Charlie Jane Anders, you guys were, you guys rock. You should do, you should go on the road, take it on the road. I would pay money to hear that again, but I won't have to, cause it'll be online. Thank you so much. And um, everyone, please check Litquake's website for updates. Our festival comes up in October and uh, we'll have lots of wonderful content for you to devour, all you book lovers out there. All right, everyone. With that, I will bid you all adieu. Thanks so much for coming. Have a good weekend.